top stories, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed says Ethiopia strives for national prosperity despite tough challenges in the nation. And United States reaffirms that Ethiopia has the right to use its water resource. Many thanks for joining us. You're watching at his news hour with the news I'm Tabitha John. Do stay with us. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed says Ethiopia strives for national prosperity despite tough challenges in the nation. The Premier said this as he inaugurated a mega highway project, which is part of the economic integration drive in the Horn region. Habtamwa Shagri has more. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed inaugurated today the Mojo Meki Batu Expressway, which is a part of the Mojo Hawasa Superhighway. The 92 kilometer long and 32 meter wide road project inaugurated today has been built at a cost of 6.3 billion baht. Upon the inaugurated ceremony, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has said it is not an easy task to complete the construction of this mega project. <laughs> We understand it is not easy to build and take Ethiopia to the height it deserves. A nation is built as we work with one hand and guard it with the other. I would like to assure you that we will continue this way and cut ribbons instead of losing hope. This will be an assurance to Ethiopia's permanent enemies that we will realize our dream of prospering Ethiopia. The mega highway project is also part of the economic integration drive in the Horn region, will be adding an impetus to the efforts underway steering up investment and trade in the region, he mentioned. The Prime Minister noted the completion of the highway will pave the way for the country's economic, social and political integration across the continent. But passing the challenges we have currently faced is priority, he stressed. <laughs> There are a great many challenges in our country today. Following this, there are a large number of Ethiopians who doubt whether the national reform aspired will be realized. However, no history tells us that there came a change without challenge. In Ethiopia, when we unite against the current lack of peace and poverty, we build prosperous Ethiopia that will help others. This road will be invaluable in facilitating economic integration in the region. Kenyans, for example, can accelerate trade with Ethiopians and similar roads from Ethiopia to Tanzania or so will help Ethiopia access markets in the region. In addition to this road, which connects us to Kenya, Ethiopia is building roads to Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea, Somalia and Djibouti. Speaking on the occasion, Minister of Transport Dagmawit Mogus calls upon the general public to protect the safety of the newly built expressway. Ethiopian Roads Authority Director General Habta Mutagin for his part said the expressway plays an unprecedented role to increase the tourism flow of the nation. This corridor brings many opportunities. Zuai in Langano Lakes, Shala, Abijata, Hawasa in Wendogenet as well as other lakes and tourist sites are located in the region. So, this expressway plays an unprecedented role to attract more tourists by expanding the service sector in this region. In addition, Bulbula and Hawasa industrial parks as well as other industries are located in the region. The expressway toll road helps to facilitate the movement of agricultural inputs and export performance of the nation at large. The second phase 110 km Batu RC Nagale Hawasa Expressway toll road construction is well underway with an outlay of 8 billion bur, it was learned. High government officials, including Speaker of House of People's Representatives Tagase Chafo and Chief of Oromia State Shimelis Abdisa attended the inauguration ceremony. 
If European government says it is committed to rebuilding Tigray region, a lot has so far been done in collaboration with UN agencies and local and international NGOs, the government said. Sintayo Tamrat has the details. In a statement issued Saturday, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said that the government of Ethiopia continues its commitment to rebuilding Tigray and ensuring that citizens in the region are sufficiently provided for the necessary assistance while rebuilding efforts are being exerted. According to the statement, in the second round of humanitarian assistance, food and non-food items have been delivered for 2.7 million beneficiaries. The statement mentions the various humanitarian activities undertaken in the Tigray region, which shows the commitment of the government. Emergency shelters and NFI kits estimated at more than 437 million were supplied for over 245,000 beneficiaries. With partners covering roughly 33% of the total requirement, a significant gap exists in non-food item supplies, the statement indicates. Issues of access to humanitarian support has been adequately addressed with the notification system that is now in place. Some of the pocket areas that were inaccessible are now being reached out through military escort. Visa extension permits are being granted and a guideline has been introduced to respond to requests for permits to use communication equipment. In an attempt to operationalize health facilities in the region with the provision of emergency supplies, up to 60 mobile health teams have so far been established. The Federal Ministry of Agriculture, for its part, has allocated 10 million birds to strengthen the Regional Agriculture and Natural Resource Bureau with over 126,000 quintals of fertilizer. The Ministry of Education has allocated BR 95 million for reopening of schools and dispatched 1 million face masks to the region. Emergency Coordination Center has been established in Mekale, comprising of relevant line ministries, regional bureau, UN agencies, as well as local and international NGOs. The statement further indicates that more than 192 staff members of UN agencies, international NGOs, including international media, have been provided access. On recovery and rehabilitation interventions, the Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Peace are closely working with EU, World Bank and United Nations Development Program in order to rebuild damaged and destroyed economic and social infrastructures in the region. Prime Minister Abiy has extended his gratitude to the international community who have partnered with the Ethiopian government to provide much-needed relief. The United States has reiterated its position that disputes over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam should only be resolved through a tripartite negotiation. U.S. once again said Ethiopia has a right to use its water resource. This was said during U.S. Senator's visit to Khartoum this week. Emmanuel Jorge tells us more. Although Egypt and Sudan are striving to politicize the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam as an international issue, they are no more succeeding with it. Delegation from the United States led by Senator Chris Kuhn has discussed with Sudanese government officials during an official visit in Khartoum this week. On the issue of the GERD, which was one part of their agenda even though Senator Chris Kuhn rejected it, Sudan requested the U.S. government to put pressure on Ethiopia to sign a legally binding agreement. Winding up the visit, Senator Chris Kuhn said that Ethiopia has a right to utilize its own water resources and Sudan has the right to get technical data and information. The U.S. Senator said for the press, the U.S. recognizes that Ethiopia has the right to build its dam, generate electricity and use its own water resources. Sudan, on the other hand, has a right to get information and data concerning the flow of water, safety of the dam and other technical details. Senator Kuhn underscored that the United States believes that the Renaissance Dam dispute must be resolved only through trilateral negotiation among the three countries. He also mentioned that he has discussed the Renaissance Dam dispute with Sudanese ministers, saying the issue should only be resolved by negotiation of the three countries. He believes that they should negotiate with a spirit of positivity. 
Though Egypt and Sudan are always trying to make the U.S. intervene in the issue of Renaissance Dam dispute, but the Biden administration is carefully examining the interests behind the request. The Egyptian media Egypt Daily recently asked the National Security Council of White House concerning the role of U.S. in resolving the GERD dispute. The council on its part replied that the United States follows fair procedures for the effectiveness of their tripartite negotiations. Spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says false narratives regarding the GERD by Egypt and lately by Sudan is pushing the dispute over the GERD to a deadlock. Talking to ETV here today, Dina Mufti said Egypt and Sudan must concentrate efforts on cooperation with a spirit of bolstering regional ties. Kazahunjani reports. The spokesperson said recent tensions regarding the Grand Ethiopian Prince and Sudan will wither if Egypt and the Sudan renounce their wrong narratives regarding the Grand Ethiopian Prince and Sudan. Dina dismissed Egypt's claims over the Grand Ethiopian Prince and Sudan and its wrong narratives about the Grand Ethiopian Prince and Sudan's harm on its share of the Nile water as exaggerated and unfounded. Wrong narratives around the Gert and the Nile River. That is, mm, mm, that are mainly advanced by the, the other side. One funny thing is about the, the source of the Nile itself. As you know, 86% of this water emanates from Ethiopian highlands. Those forces, those sides are even lenient and hesitant to accept this reality. They, some of them advance a wrong narrative of the water perhaps emanating uh, from their border or from their territory. The other narrative, wrong narrative, is that Ethiopia is hesitant, Ethiopia is intransigent, Ethiopia is not willing. These are wrong narratives that are out to mislead the rest of the, the global community. And uh, these narratives are wrong narratives. Uh, narratives about Ethiopia's intentions, narratives about even the positions of the Nile River, narratives about the utility of this water. If this dam hurts them, why they always argue strongly in strong terms about Ethiopia releasing some share, some amount of water during the prolonged drought in, in Egypt? Why do they intend to hurt their, uh, their water bank? A dam that could benefit them. Stating that the spokesperson and public diplomacy director general noted that a second round filling of the Grand Ethiopian Prince and Sudan will have no effect on the downstream countries. Instead, it will probably solve the problem of flood threatening the Sudan. According to Dina, Sudan's flip flopping on the issue and siding with Egypt, while it has enormous benefits to gain from the dam, shows lack of maturity among its leadership. To begin with the Sudanese, there is a huge flood that normally attacks Sudanese during the rainy season in the highlands of Ethiopia. It has happened only last year. And uh, when you store water in the dam, Sudanese, this water will be regulated. So they will benefit from the dam. They will, it will save them from the huge flood which attacks them on annual basis. They have been admitting it at, until recently. Ever recently, one of their leaders have been saying, had Ethiopia filled the dam earlier on, that flood attack would not uh, encounter them. This is one. Second, there is sedimentation that is carried out by the river, by the water from Ethiopian highlands. It reduces sediment, sedimentation as well. That sedimentation hurts Sudanese uh, dams as well. They, that they will get excess water for their agricultural activities as well. That benefit has been approved by the Tekaze Dam, and this is the second major benefit to the Sudanese as well. The third one is they will get cheap electricity. Not only cheap, but safe 
environmentally safe electricity. Dina called upon the two nations to desist from engaging in unlawful measures regarding the dam, adding they must strive to find African solution to the clearly African problem. Basically, as you know, the current status of negotiation is that Ethiopia is ready um, to agree on the feeling and the operation of the feeling. Uh, Ethiopia is ready also to give data to the Sudanese and the Egyptians. And we are ready to invite them to observe the first feeling. And we have agreed, we offered actually to agree on this and to even sign a document. So the other side is intransigent. They are insisting on uh, comprehensive agreement and the water sharing. We are saying that that takes a process. When it comes to water sharing, it takes 11 repairing countries to come together and discuss about it. Um, about the comprehensive agreement as well, it takes sometimes, it needs times. Actually, we are not ruling out anything, except that we are telling them, let us agree on the feeling and the uh, operation of the feeling and let us even sign a document on that, sign a treatise on that. This is what Ethiopia's position is all about. Ethiopia has already announced the second filling of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam will happen come July this year when the rains are at the highest. A prominent Israeli scholar says Ethiopia has all the right to press ahead with the building of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam Gert inside its sovereign territory. In a televised Middle East update, the influential speaker Amir Tsarfati explains why Egypt and Sudan are so bothered about the $5 billion dam said to be Africa's biggest upon completion. Daniel Kazahun brings us up to speed. Now, about 80% complete, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, the GERD is here to produce electricity for Ethiopia's domestic consumption and for export to neighboring countries. The water used to power the turbines will be returned to the river downstream from the dam. The Egyptians have continued to undermine the role of the African Union, calling for an external intervention. This Egyptian scholar, who appeared recently on France 24, is openly calling for a vigorous action on Ethiopia since Sudan's claim of Ben Shangul Gums will take time to materialize. <laughs> Meanwhile, a prominent Israeli scholar, Amir Sarfati, argued that the dam will not decrease the flow of water to either the Sudan or Egypt. When you generate electricity, all you need is for the water to have certain velocity so it will obviously sp uh, spin the turbines to create the electricity. That's all. In other words, you don't lose the water. You just uh, delay the water flow. That's all. So Ethiopia is not going to keep the water to itself. It's going just to delay it so it will create the effect that Ethiopia needs to bring enough supply of power and electricity to its own people in in a resource, natural resource, that within their own country. The timetable for accumulation has been the subject of a decade of negotiations between the two countries, she said, adding, and there is still no agreement on crucial issues. The Israeli scholar explains why Egypt and Sudan are so bothered about Ethiopian development project, the GERD. Why is Egypt so bothered by all of, of what's going on? Not because Israel is now, uh, Egypt is now going to suffer from lack of water. First of all, Israel is, um, Egypt is afraid that Ethiopia will see that the water is so good, let's use it for agriculture as well. Adding urgency to the matter, the dam is so near completion that Ethiopia could start filling the reservoir this summer and the rainy season has only just begun. Egypt is determined to stop this from happening until an agreement has been reached, it said. Adding downstream countries don't want anybody to touch the Nile, which is a manifestation of their rationality. And by the way, the Egyptians are, are very angry about the Ethiopians. Uh, Earlier this month, there was an air 
um, military exercise of the air forces of Sudan and Egypt together, and they called it the Eagles of the Nile. And they, uh, they said very clearly that they are not willing to uh, let the, somebody steal the water of the Nile from them. But I want to tell you something, folks. <laughs> not willing, but uh, let me make it very clear so you all understand. For Ethiopia, the dam is the symbol of its industrial ambitions and of its determination to escape the historical poverty that afflicts its population. Freeman says U.S. Senator's call for postponing Ethiopian election is foolish and very dangerous. Freeman criticizes the senator's opinions about Ethiopia, which almost exclusively bases on media or from Amnesty International and rejects Ethiopia's intricate history of 125 years. This could encourage and fuel post-election violence, he said on an article he wrote on Friday. Sundayo Tamra tells us more from the article. On his latest article, Lawrence Freeman, who is a political economic analyst for Africa, says Ethiopia is to conduct national parliamentary elections that will be decisive not only for Ethiopia, but the entire Horn of Africa. On the eve of special envoy, Ambassador Jeffrey Feltman is first trip to the Horn of Africa. Five Democratic U.S. senators sent him a letter expressing their concerns about Ethiopia. Unfortunately, in their letter, the senators displayed a shallow understanding, one might even say ignorance, about the conflict in Ethiopia. Furthermore, their suggestion that Ethiopia's national elections should not go forward is downright dangerous. One wonders if these senators have any knowledge of the last any knowledge of the last 125-year intricate history of Ethiopia. A period span is from the March 1, 1896 victory at Adwa by Emperor Menelik II against the Italian colonial army to the present efforts by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed to unify the Ethiopian nation through the newly created non-ethnic-based prosperity party. The senators appeared to have based their opinions about Ethiopia almost exclusively on news reports or from Amnesty International, he argues. It is outrageous for members of the U.S. Senate to suggest that a sovereign nation should cancel their elections. To my knowledge, only one party, not several, has chosen to abstain. However, these U.S. senators' accusations are giving cover for more parties to withdraw. The writer reminds readers that, in response to this call to postpone upcoming election of Ethiopia, Ethiopia's ambassador to Washington, Fitzumarega, replied on May 4 in his own letter to Ambassador Feltman. 
Ambassador Fitzum wrote that the upcoming June parliamentary election will be a historic milestone in the political transformation of Ethiopia. The Ethiopian National Electoral Board, which is the most independent electoral body in the history of the nation, has been established and is responsible for organizing, conducting, and oversighting the election and election-related activities, Ambassador Fetsum said. Freeman explains that despite the best efforts by Ethiopian government to conduct its most open and transparent election in the last 26 years, no doubt difficulties will occur in the voting process. However, Opposition political parties will now be able to opportunistically claim the election is illegitimate and contest the result, citing allegations from the U.S. senators later. This could fuel violence, thus making it, thus making it more challenging for the government to manage post-election violence, he implied. It should be noted that the United States has never postponed a national election, despite severe dislocations of its people, not during World War II, not during the Great Depression, not during the Spanish flu, and not during the surge of the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to the largest number of male imbalances in U.S. history. Turkish ambassador to Ethiopia reaffirmed his country's commitment to bolster ties with Ethiopia in the field of migration. The ambassador said in an exclusive interview with ETV that Turkey will join hands with Ethiopia in combating terrorism. Meanwhile, Turkey says it respects the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ethiopia. Sintayo Tamrat sat down with the ambassador and compiled the following report. Turkey and Ethiopia have diplomatic relations going back to 125 years. Over the century and a quarter, the two have been enjoying friendship and comprehensive cooperation. The two governments have extended numerous high-level visits that produced very important outcomes that helped expedite the development of joint cooperation on both sides. The recent visit to Ankara by Ethiopian Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Demeka Mekonen has added a new stimulus to the bilateral ties, according to the ambassador. His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister Demeka Mekonen, was in Ankara uh, two months ago uh, in order to celebrate the 125th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the two countries. And of course, this turned into a very good uh, meeting. Also, in order to recap, in order to summarize how relations have been and how relations should be taken forward between the two ministers. So this added a new impetus to Turkish-Ethiopian relations, especially in these days where all over the world we're going through difficult, complicated times. And these two old friends, Turkey and Ethiopia, were together again thinking about how they can overcome their challenges. Hailing Ethiopia as Turkey's first ally, Ambassador Alps said Turkey and Ethiopia have achieved a lot through institutions like Turkish Cooperation and Coordination Agency. Addis Ababa was the first capital in sub-Saharan Africa where uh, Turkey opened a consulate in Harar in 1912 and an embassy in 1926. And again Addis Ababa, again Ethiopia was a first. It was Tika's first office in sub-Saharan Africa in Addis. So you can see the importance that Turkey attaches to Ethiopia, always a first. The Nejashi uh, Mosque tomb in Tigray, which was uh, renovated by Tika and handed over to the Ethiopian government last summer. Uh, this, of course, is a very, very important spot for, for Muslims, but also for the whole international cultural uh, community. And so we were very proud to do that. The second project that Tika completed uh, was the, Harar, the consulate in Harar that was opened in 1912. The two countries are currently working together on terrorism and migration among other regional issues, the ambassador stated. Our relations encompass many areas, uh, cultural, educational, investment, trade, political. We are the types of countries that face the same challenges. We both have to fight terrorism. Uh, we both have are open armed uh, with uh, migrants, uh, refugees. So we face the same challenges and we are trying to work together. We have been trying to work together at the UN on these issues and we think we need to take this forward on the international arena. Turkey respects the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ethiopia and wants the sustenance of Ethiopia's economic growth as well as regional role. Turkey says, has always said since the beginning of this uh, issue, that for us the political unity of Ethiopia is important, that the territorial integrity of Ethiopia is important, and we want this to continue. Uh, 
in the way that you wish. Political unity, territorial integrity are the words that we have been using all along. And we hope that soon this issue will be resolved and the, and the booming economy and the growing role of Ethiopia in this region will uh, continue as we have been seeing. The two countries have signed multiple agreements that will take the tie to a new level of cooperation. And finally, Ethiopian Ministry of Culture and Tourism vows to provide significant support for research in the hospitality sector. This remark came during the Hotel and Tourism Annual Research Conference in Bahardar City. Habta Mouashagri has more. We said keynote address catering and tourism training institute director Ashe Dawi said the conference aims to bring problem solving research findings in tourism sector. Minister of Culture and Tourism Hirut Kasa for her part said the conference helps to bring vibrant service sector by using new technologies as well as to use the nation's tourism potential. The Gorgora, Koisha, and Wonchi Eco Tourism Mega Projects are some indicators to work more in the service sector in the near future, it was learned. Further coordination activities between stakeholders are also critical to solve bottlenecks in the service sector. The Catering Tourism and Training Institute and Bahada University have organized the two day long hotel and tourism annual research conference. You're watching Addis News Hour, a quick reminder of today's headlines. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed says Ethiopia strives for national prosperity despite tough challenges in the nation. And the United States reaffirms that Ethiopia has the right to use its water resource.
Well, that's all we had for now. I'm Tabitha Jomi. Thanks for watching. Good night. Thank you.